Today we're talking to Fred Thiel, he's the CEO of Marathon Digital. Marathon Digital is a leading Bitcoin mining firm in the US and he will provide us some information on Bitcoin mining's energy usage as well as there were some risks ahead with the proof of work technology. So enjoy the conversation. Maybe Fred, um, how about you introducing yourself to the crowd? Sure, absolutely. Firstly, thank you very much for having me on your program. I, I really appreciate what you're doing, not just for the industry, but I think it's just great to see somebody um, like you doing this. It's, uh, I'm sure that um, your listeners are very proud of what you do. Uh, so I've been the CEO of Marathon now for, I think almost, this is my fourth week most probably, uh, though I've been on the board of the company since uh, 2018, so about three years. So very familiar with uh, all of the strategy and the execution that we've done. Uh, my background is you know, lots of years in the technology industry, running technology companies. I've had the good fortune of being able to do IPOs and a lot of uh, other strategic transactions and then shifted and spent time on the investor side as a managing partner of a private equity firm. And uh, I'm also a general partner in a venture capital firm. So I've played both the investor side as well as the operator side um, and I'm a very big believer in um, blockchain and uh, the new technologies, disruptive technologies that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other platforms uh, are really bringing to the marketplace and how they're going to impact the financial markets uh, for the benefit of both customers and the institutions. Uh, and I think it's a very exciting business area to be in. Um, I think especially, uh, you know, Switzerland was very early with the Crypto Valley in Zug, and um, you know, I've had the pleasure of being able to spend quite a bit of time there in the past. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think we're going to see a very interesting global business uh, around uh, cryptocurrencies, digital assets, and really the digitization of the whole financial markets. So very excited to be here. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, maybe just to start off, um, if I think about um, the energy problem of Bitcoin, um, there are, are thousands of other solutions, thousands of other coins that try to um, solve a certain problem. But um, now a new idea about five years um, ago has come up, proof of stake. And so um, proof of stake is definitely much more um, energy friendly. Um, but now my question is, what risk does proof of stake bears compared to proof of work? Uh, great question. Uh, very complex question. Uh, the original design uh, that uh, Sanoshi did in the white paper was to create a decentralized network where the security and value of the network would grow as the number of miners, if you would, participants in the network grew. And the, which if you think about Bitcoin, what Bitcoin really is, is a store of value for energy. And this is an argument that many people have made. Uh, it's not something I came up with. Uh, this is a common belief amongst the industry that Bitcoin miners essentially use power, especially renewable energy that otherwise would go wasted because it either is in excess of the demand at the time and therefore can't be consumed by consumers uh, or it's not, uh, they don't have the transmission lines to get the power to where the consumers are. And so, Bitcoin mining is the ideal way of storing value of energy because we convert energy into Bitcoins. And when those Bitcoins are sold, they can be used for procuring energy. So it's an ideal storage medium uh, for energy. If you then go to the area of kind of why use a methodology that consumes so much energy? Well, the bigger the network of miners becomes, um, which is driven by really the price of Bitcoin and the value of the Bitcoin network, the more secure it becomes. The barrier to entry for somebody to take control of the Bitcoin network, a 51% attack as it's called, becomes much, much, much lower as the total network grows and the amount of capital expenditure that people put into that network expands. Um, if you think about mining pools versus individual miners, a mining pool is really just a way for a group of miners to aggregate their overall hash rate and um, have a higher chance, in theory, of winning Bitcoin rewards. Uh, 
mining pools don't really um, necessarily drive adoption of protocol changes or things like that. Those are done at the individual miner level and at the individual node level. So a mining pool is really just an aggregation of hash rate as a way to share and rewards. Um, and outside of that has not too great a function. It's really just a mechanism for aggregating uh, overall hash rate. If you look at the Bitcoin network's overall hash rate, it continues to grow at fairly rapid numbers because of the attractiveness of being in this market. And that just makes it even more secure. If you look at the Ethereum network, for example, uh, Ethereum still to this day, and I think Vitalik Buterin just published something recently on Twitter where um, the Berlin fork, which they recently did, uh, closed a, an exploit loophole that could have taken the whole Ethereum network down. So I think Ethereum is still evolving as it goes through its various forks and transitions. It's moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, the difference there um, is that in proof of stake, uh, you're essentially using economic leverage as the um, stick, if you would, for making sure that people continue to validate blocks properly. However, there's still some mining that has to happen, and there's still compute power that has to happen. But it's, uh, the goal is to decrease uh, the amount of power and the amount of miners that are needed to do that. However, um, and this is something Vitalik has also written about, in a world with um, stake nodes, uh, there is an ability for um, potential sharding of networks and uh, for... Um, the network to not have full consensus. And so I think the jury is still out regarding which model is preferential when you're thinking about security and stability of a network. Uh, back in 2017, there was an attempt by a number of miners to try and change the Bitcoin protocol. And even though they had nearly 80% of the hash rate represented um, by groups, that change was not uh, did not go through. And that just proves the robustness and the independence of the Bitcoin network. Um, as you look at power consumption going forward, um, there have been a number of studies that have been done that show that uh, on a global level, um, Bitcoin miners are predominantly moving towards renewable energy sources. Uh, and I think the number that typically is touted in most studies, um, CoinShare did a study and there was another study previous to that, uh, about 70 plus percent. If you look at Marathon specifically, we just made an announcement today, this morning, for an additional 250 megawatts of power um, that we're adding to host an additional 70,000 miners that we're deploying between now and uh, March of next year, which will be 100% carbon neutral. That will bring our overall pool of miners to 70% carbon neutral. And over the course of the next 12 months, our goal is to move towards 100% carbon neutral mining. And so that's how we're doing our part in trying to move the industry that way. Now, when you think about carbon neutral energy sources, it's a combination of renewable sources, wind, solar, potentially nuclear, uh, et cetera. And we're examining all opportunities for power. Um, if you look at the Chinese miners, on the other hand, especially uh, in Inner Mongolia, it is predominantly uh, coal-based. And so the vast majority of the sort of coal-based um, mining that's done in the world uh, is actually done predominantly in China. Most of the North American miners have moved fairly um, completely towards carbon neutral solutions. So I think the argument regarding power, it becomes a little moot. Um, some people like to compare the power consumption of um, proof of work and Bitcoin mining to that of the power consumption of countries. Uh, you know, Switzerland is sometimes often used as an example that the Bitcoin network consumes more power than all of Switzerland does. Um, that's true, but when you really look at the where that power would otherwise go, uh, a large percentage of the power that the Bitcoin miners consume would normally have been lost uh, because it can't be consumed, either because of the time of day or um, because of transmission issues. Uh, if you also look at just transmitting power across countries in their power grids. There's a huge amount of power lost through waste due to heat and impedance in that distribution system. And again, some studies have shown that up to 23% of the power produced in the world goes to waste simply through transmission. And Bitcoin miners don't use transmission because they're typically co-located on 
the power generator site, and so they're using baseload power, as it's called, uh, which means it's power that hasn't hit the grid. So it's power that otherwise um, wouldn't be used for consumers, for example. So it, we're not taking power away from somebody so much as predominantly using uh, excess power. And we have to use that excess power because we're looking for the lowest cost power, which means we're typically the customer of last resort for the power companies. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful in, in kind of explaining the, the power question as relates to, uh, to Bitcoin and uh, especially proof of work versus proof of stake. Yes, definitely. Um, now the question does, that comes to mind is, um, you know, you mentioned the, the energy source, but how can we improve um, proof of work um, to make it more carbon neutral? In other ways, is there um, maybe an innovative way um, in the hardware side, on the hardware side, or um, is there a, does the problem really lie in, in, in the energy source itself? So it's a great question. So there are two drivers of energy consumption. Um, one is the uh, performance needs of the miners themselves. The nature of Bitcoin mining is that of a race. Uh, everybody is competing to solve this mathematical problem, so you are incentivized by the reward mechanism to use faster and faster hardware. Um, you are incentivized to use uh, less power because as the amount of power required to generate a Bitcoin in aggregate uh, goes up, um, it becomes very expensive. So Bitcoin miners are incentivized to look for ways to have lower power consumption through efficiencies in hardware, and um, used the power that otherwise would go to waste. And uh, again, back to kind of the renewable sources, if you think about solar energy, uh, solar energy has its maximum production capacity typically between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. during the day. That's when the sun is at its most powerful. Uh, prior to that in the morning and later than that in the afternoon, the power uh, becomes less. If you think about when most power is consumed and when most people use power, it tends to be in the afternoons and evenings. Uh, people aren't in their homes during the day often. Um, in warm climates, they run their ventilation and cooling systems in the afternoons when the temperature rises, and in the evenings when they're home, they're cooking and they're doing other things. So solar energy produced in the middle of the day, if you can't store it in batteries, and today there are still not um, economical utility scale, meaning, you know, gigawatts capacity um, battery systems that allow you to efficiently store solar energy. So uh, that's an issue. So there's a lot of solar energy that goes to waste and power uh, grids need to have some amount of uh, typically clean gas, uh, nuclear or other types of power generation available to fill that gap because Consumers don't want to turn on their stove and have it not work. They always want to have power and they expect to have power whenever they need it. And so the power companies always have to produce based on a theoretical maximum consumption that they can plan for. Um, outside of solar, you have wind energy. Wind energy typically generates the most amount of energy in the afternoons when the winds have picked up and generate uh, power. But they dissipate in the evenings and they're typically not very efficient in the mornings. And again, you get to this battery issue where you get all this great wind energy, but you can't store it. And so that energy goes to waste. And specifically with wind and solar, Bitcoin mining is a great way to think of it as a financial battery. You're converting that excess energy that otherwise goes to waste. You're converting it into Bitcoin. That Bitcoin can then be used as a store of value to convert that monetary energy into a resource to either procure energy again or procure other things. Uh, if you look outside of wind and solar, you have things like nuclear, which is very clean. Uh, in many countries of the world, um, especially in Europe, for example, there's quite a lot of nuclear energy, especially in France. Some countries have worked to shut down their nuclear uh, power and are moving towards more and more renewable. But I think the key issue it remains this utility scale storage of energy. Once there is an economical way to store energy through batteries, uh, the world can go off of fossil fuels. But until that time, the world still needs to have the ability uh, to turn power on and off as needed uh, based on the requirements of consumers. Um, there are other things that are changing this um, 
For example, in North America, you're starting to see what are called um, community level power utilities. A community level power utility is essentially a group of um, families, it could be a village, it could be a small town, who have solar or wind energy, uh, consume that power themselves and have a smaller scale storage facility for the energy um, that can be built today. So community level power storage uh, through battery systems can actually operate quite economically. But that requires communities to deploy all this power. Um, it isn't a government paying for it. The community has to pay for it. And so there's a time lag between when people would want to do this and when it actually happens that's really being driven by the investment cycle. And I think over time, we'll see more and more community power happening. And what's interesting is the excess capacity that the community generates could be actually used for Bitcoin mining because otherwise that power would be wasted. So again, proof of work and Bitcoin mining becomes a way to leverage the investment that these communities have in deploying the infrastructure for community power because it's a way for them to get a return on that investment outside of just charging their members for electricity, which otherwise would be wasted. Yes, interesting. So, so your take is basically that we will accelerate the adoption of renewable energy with Bitcoin mining. Absolutely. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I think the, if you think about it, Bitcoin mining provides an economic incentive for communities, for utilities, and for the development of the technologies around renewable because we're such a large consumer of power. And if you uh, think about a country where you start deploying these big solar farms, uh, so in the United States, in the state of Nevada, which is where uh, Marathon is located, there are some large solar farms that are utility grade uh, power uh, generation facilities. Um, if you think about the challenge there is you have this beautiful power generation facility in the desert, but it needs to transmit its electricity that it produces to cities and consumers. And how do you get the grid to invest in that transmission mechanism? And so to do that efficiently, uh, you could build a solar farm, run Bitcoin production on that solar farm with no impact to the grid. And then over time, you could add uh, grid to it and that solar farm could then start producing energy for the grid. And the total overall investment would be uh, decreased because of the revenues earned from Bitcoin mining. Um, so I think that's another driver of renewable energy. The Bitcoin miners of the world are clearly driving this uh, cost reduction and the deployment. And as if you look at renewable energy charts that regarding how much is produced, there is a substantial increase now every quarter in both wind, solar, and other means um, that is really driven by a lot of uh, the investment being done uh, by Bitcoin miners in alternative power sources. Yes. And also now, um, if we actually think about a future with proof of stake, let's assume proof of stake becomes, uh, becomes an actual um, new normal. Um, I read a lot of messages um, stating, uh, well, all the, all the cheap use will go to waste. And um, where, where do you see hardware in, in proof of stake? So yeah, so you, you, the blockchain still needs to be calculated. So um, think about a bank today. Um, a bank is a central authority that operates under proof of stake. They still have huge computing systems <laughs> that require huge amounts of power to operate to manage understanding who has what in what bank account, which is the same as proof of stake, who has what in what wallet. And every stake node and every node on the Ethereum network, even in a proof of stake model, has to have a complete copy of all the UTXOs, which are essentially all the wallets, um, and the balances, and through consensus, validate those. And so if you don't have that, then uh, there's a problem. And so there is still going to be a need for compute power, um, even in a proof of stake world. Now, granted, you could say, let's take all these consumer devices that are out there, allocate five or 6% of the compute power of those devices. And so therefore create a uh, low energy cost way of maintaining the ledgers in various networks. But when you start adding up running five or 10% of the energy of everybody's iPhones, you end up at a calculation that isn't necessarily that far off from proof of work. So I think proof of stake um, 
on paper looks like a uh, more economical form than uh, proof of work. But I think um, we still have to see that in reality. And uh, I think there's, the jury is still a little bit out. And at the same time, um, there's also the issue of security. Uh, you know, the proof of stake is still, um, has not been battle tested in quite the same way that a proof of work has. So I, I think the jury's still out on that. Yes, interesting. Uh, maybe about the security, um, when it comes to proof of work, Do you think what are the risks ahead that can potentially um, confront us in the in the coming years, um, or you know whether it's um, quantum computing or a, a selfish mining uh, miner or a mining death spiral? What what where do you see risks? So um, to attack, what are potential risks that that we can be confronted with? So uh, if you were to uh, think about quantum, which you mentioned, uh, and the risk of a quantum computer hacking the blockchain, um, the target wallet that anybody would want to hack is Satoshi's own wallet because it contains the vast majority of Bitcoins of any wallet on the uh, blockchain. Um, and so people are constantly watching it to see <laughs> what is happening there. Um, a quantum computer, um, the power required to hack a wallet, uh, we're still five to eight years away from even a state-sponsored um, actor uh, who, with access to quantum computers being able to effectively uh, hack a wallet. And as you look at how the Bitcoin protocol will likely evolve in the future, um, you will see some additional uh, security measures added to it Uh, such as double encryption, um, which could make push that quantum uh, point even further out by decades uh, by simply making the problem mathematically even more complex. And so um, in talking with experts in the field and uh, part of my background for a number of years, I was chairman of a German company uh, that is quite a leader in cryptography. And that company um, has been very active in post-quantum encryption. And their technology that they build are the hardware security modules that are used by blockchain operators, by banks, by financial institutions to secure the keys to all of their systems. Uh, and so very familiar with sort of the impact of quantum on all of these asymmetric uh, types of encryption schemes. And uh, the SHA-256 algorithm is very difficult to crack. Um, and as I said, I think, you know, quantum computers are still five to eight years out from doing that. And between now and then, I think the uh, developers in the blockchain will deploy additional means to further secure the blockchain and make it even harder. Uh, other attack vectors, uh, you know, a 51% attack, it gets more and more difficult to have 51% of the blockchain because everybody's continually adding systems. As soon as somebody starts aggregating 20, 30% of the global hash rate, you'll see more people continuing to try and combat that because the economic incentive in Bitcoin is a finite incentive. It's today 900 Bitcoin per day that are made, no matter what the global hash rate is. And the algorithm automatically adjusts. Were the price of Bitcoin to crash, you would see the number of miners would decrease, the global hash rate would go down because the economic incentive to um, mine Bitcoin would become substantially decreased. As the price of Bitcoin goes up, more people are incentivized to come on. And that creates a higher and higher and higher bar that somebody would have to meet to be able to execute a 51% attack. And just the sheer capital required in machines, which uh, if you've been following the Bitcoin hardware market, uh, there's a shortage of machines because of the shortage of ASICs. Uh, just acquiring that many machines and acquiring the power contracts um, to do that are such a significant barrier to entry that um, it makes it quite difficult. Now, at the same time, there was a lot of talk about uh, China controlling uh, the blockchain because so much hash power was located in China. Well, as you've been following the news, you'll see that fewer and fewer miners are staying in China. They're starting to move towards North America. And if anything, potentially North America will become the central uh, location that miners prefer to operate in because of the power regulatory environment, availability of cheap renewable energy, and just the legal system and the regulatory framework around it.
Yes. So apparently you see a very bright future for Bitcoin in the coming years. Um, so how, how do, you, do you see the adoption in the coming years? How will we integrate Bitcoin in our everyday life? Um, or won't it be so consumer oriented, much more um, for uh, certain hidden use cases? Um, you know, I, I don't, I think of Bitcoin and the blockchain as a settlement network for settling transactions. Um, I don't necessarily see people using Bitcoin to buy a bus ticket or um, pay for an Uber ride. Um, the transaction costs today are too high for that. But uh, if you look at the news recently, you're seeing uh, major U.S. banks are now starting to um, adopt um, services whereby they'll be able to provide custody of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as well as purchasing and selling of it. Uh, I think you're seeing uh, a whole business around the DeFi world that is has been created around being able to earn yield on your Bitcoin by depositing it in an account and then that Bitcoin that you've deposited there is lent out, just like money is lent out by a bank uh, to people who need to borrow it and you receive an interest on that Bitcoin. And you're seeing more and more institutional investors building fund and uh, financial instruments, derivative instruments around Bitcoin and other cryptos. So it's really becoming a major part of the financial ecosystem, both at the consumer level, the institutional investor level, and at the bank and government level. Uh, I think you may have seen that many uh, central banks are deploying, whether it's experiments or fully functional, um, digital currencies as ways to make their systems more efficient. Uh, the U.S. Federal ba uh, Central Bank has uh, a project uh, to evaluate digital currency, and they're publishing the findings of that this summer. And I think we'll see that um, the U.S. Fed will issue a type of digital dollar that will be primarily designed to replace the SWIFT wire transfer platform as a way to make uh, transfers between counterparties instantaneous, as opposed to having to go through a lot of hops and hoops. I think you're going to see custody of um, securities and uh, other types of instruments tokenized such that they can be settled instantly as opposed to over two or three days, uh, as is currently um, the case. And so I, I think you're seeing Bitcoin and Ethereum and products built on both of those platforms really permeating the economy in a variety of levels. And uh, blockchain will be adopted for everything from identity management to medical data, to financial records, title on ownership of homes, cars, and other assets. Uh, you know, NFTs have already penetrated the art world and uh, allow people to monetize a physical piece of art uh, in additional forms. Uh, through digital means and smart contracts will become a more and more common way of enabling people to manage intellectual property rights. And so I'm very bullish on the future of blockchain and how it's going to impact the economy and our lives on a daily basis. And I think it's going to put control of financial assets and a control of data and identity uh, really in the hand of the consumers and away from central authorities. And do you also see some um, interesting business use cases emerging. Uh, so do you see them emerging, which are profitable? Um, so a lot of times the question is raised um, whether these um, business, um, whether these business can actually turn them um, turn a profit um, after five years or so. Um, but um, are there actually interesting businesses um, in in the space in the ecosystem that that will be that will surprise us with very high profit margins and yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, so today, obviously, um, trading of digital assets uh, has been quite lucrative for people who are good at it because volatility in any market creates opportunities for people to make money. And the volatility that exists in the crypto world has obviously benefited people, you know, with uh, Bitcoin going up and down 20 or 30 percent uh, in a week multiple times. Um, that creates huge opportunities for people who are making a profit on those transactions. So you have the financial trading of crypto assets is one area where a great amount of profit has been made. Um, I think you're going to see profits made in the lending world around these DeFi platforms, and uh, many of those companies are starting to become quite profitable. 
Uh, I think you're also going to see companies uh, that leverage the blockchain for uh, other forms of data sharing and uh, the building of apps on top of that as becoming uh, quite profitable. Uh, there is a belief, I think, amongst some people in the cloud industry, so think about the software as a service world, where instead of data being uh, held behind the walls, if you would, of the SaaS provider, the data would be on a blockchain, easily accessible, and what the SaaS provider is doing is really just providing applications that allow users to leverage that data. But because the data is on the blockchain, uh, it can be protected through tokenization, which is a type of encryption, um, but it would allow people to observe and know what's going on. And I think that level of transparency is going to be very important in uh, some future businesses. And uh, I'm very optimistic about what we're going to see over the next two decades in this space. Uh, the IoT, Internet of Things world, is very actively pushing towards leveraging blockchain because imagine... Uh, a company that has a very complex supply chain, very complex manufacturing processes, if they could expose their whole supply chain on a blockchain so all the p parties and counterparties that they work with could see exactly where goods were in transit, when they were going to arrive, imagine how more efficient they would be if they could operate that way. And I think that's what's really going to drive the adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrencies and digital assets are a core component of all that infrastructure. Yes. Um, Marathon Digital, um, you're a crypto pure play, pure play and uh, you have multiple mining farms, if I understood that correct. Um, you didn't turn a profit yet, but um, what are your plans ahead? Well, actually, in the first quarter of this year, we had uh, quite a nice profit. Uh, I think it was about uh, 87 cents per share, um, yeah. substantially higher than expected. Um, so as you look at us, you know, we are scaling uh, to uh, over 100,000 miners over the course of the next seven months, seven, eight months. Um, by the time we reach the end of the first quarter of next year, uh, we'll have over 100,000 miners in operation and uh, be generating about 10 exahash uh, of hash rate, which is the equivalent of about 6% of the global hash rate today. Uh, granted, the hash rate keeps climbing. Um, but we will continue to be very aggressive in deploying um, mining resources. Uh, we believe that um, you know, it's an important function we serve to the industry uh, in securing the blockchain and validating transactions. Um, and so we're very proud to be able to do that. Uh, the price of Bitcoin obviously drives our profitability, but we have a fairly low cost to produce a Bitcoin. And uh, if you were to look at... Um, sort of the analyst projections for the company, you'll see that the profit margins can be uh, quite large. And so as a company, we become very profitable over the next year. If you think about um, the number of uh, mining farms we have, part of that has to do with redundancy. Um, you know, if uh, any one facility were to go offline, the financial impact to us would be quite large. It's no different than uh, a large uh, oil producer, if the refinery goes down, it has a huge impact on their profitability. So from a redundancy perspective and risk management perspective, um, it's important for us to be able to distribute our mining across facilities uh, such that uh, we decrease the risk of any one facility having a major impact uh, on us. But we'll continue to deploy miners across multiple locations, multiple places, multiple power sources, to optimize our ability to leverage renewable energy um, and uh, locations where we think uh, the cost to operate is optimal. And what makes Marathon Digital unique compared to these other mining farm operators in the US? What's your plan to, to, to stand out? Well, part of it is scale. Um, as a public company, we have the ability to raise considerable capital through the public markets. And as we continue to scale, our operating costs uh, decrease. You know, our primary input driver is power cost. And as one of the largest buyers of power uh, around, uh, you know, for example, this agreement we announced today was 250 megawatts of power. Uh, there aren't many companies that can go out and uh, a uh, consume that type of power or cut the type of deals to do that. And we're doing that with almost no CapEx at all. So it's hugely efficient. 
uh, from a capital perspective for our business. And being able to do that allows us to get better pricing on power because of the volume. It allows us to get better pricing on hardware. It lets us have greater influence with hardware providers uh, to hopefully drive a goal of more power efficient miners. And it, it's a business of scale. It's, uh, you can look at Amazon, for example, and um, how hard it would be to compete with Amazon or how hard it would be to compete with Google. When you reach a certain scale, um, the competitive set is reduced to like members. And there are other miners who are following the exact same strategy as we are. And I think over time, you'll see a fairly even distribution of uh, small miners who are able to operate very efficiently and turn on and off their systems based on their power costs and availability of uh, you know cheap renewable energy. You'll see large scale miners that operate uh, at a different level of efficiency just because of their scale. Um, and uh, you know, not dissimilar to any other industry uh, that is capital intensive. And uh, the mining business is very capital intensive. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to add anything to this conversation uh, about you, about your company, um, about this discussion? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I think we're very big believers in doing everything we can to facilitate not just the safe operation of the blockchain, but also the innovation around better hardware systems, uh, better power options, um, less power use, uh, but also very importantly, the integration of the blockchain into financial systems. And so I think you know, you're gonna continue to see us be very uh, vocal about topics around energy, topics around uh, security uh, of the blockchain, stability of the blockchain, uh, about bringing hash rate to North America and also supporting certain projects and protocols that we think really drive the best innovation in this field. Um, and we're gonna be very supportive of working with financial institutions at being able to enable them to leverage the power of Bitcoin as an investment instrument uh, to bring to market financial products. Thank you very much for the conversation, Fred. Thank you very much, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.